Hello and welcome to another edition of the How to Grow Your E-commerce Business podcast. This week we're talking to Matt Harrison from Next Net, Next Net Media and we're going to talk about everything to do with link building. So Matt, first question, what is link building? Well, first off, Trevor, I'd really like to say thank you for uh, inviting me on your podcast. Like, I, this is this is great. I love being able to come on to different places and sort of evangelize uh, link building and all of the different things that you know it can bring to your um, your website. So again, thank you for taking the time to talk. You're welcome. Um, what is link building? Link building, uh, for lack of a better phrase, is really trying to find additional signals from around the internet that come from other publications that point to your publication in hopes of having them have enough value to show those signals to Google so that they want to rank your site higher for very specific keywords. Okay. So why, I mean, obviously link building has been, you know, <clears throat> been around since, you know, since, you know, link building is important since Google started to take link building as, as a, like a, an authority signal. Um, but there's been a lot of changes to the Google algorithm over the years. How does link building really, is it still as important as it used to be? Um, I think that its importance will always be there. I think one of the major things that link building does is it just, again, shines a signal that your website is being talked about, right? If the algorithm is a thousand different data points, not all of them hold the same weight, but over and over and over again, we do find that when we work with our clients, those signals that are um, higher domain authority, high, higher domain rating sites talking about yours, they actually do help move the needle in the right direction because it so, means yeah. that Google is seeing there's chatter. So is there, is there more or less importance on link building than they, than they used to be? I think it really kind of depends on where you are in your website's um, evolution. If you have a brand new website that's just come out, I don't know that link building is the first thing you want to be focusing in on. But if you're a more established brand and you're able to see exactly who your competitors are, and when you have an understanding of what it's going to take for you to reach them or maybe reach parity or separate yourself from them further, um, that's when it actually starts to have a lot more value. Okay. So, where, so where, how, when people are you know, doing a link building camp or starting to think about the SEO of their website, how should they split their time between link building and, and say, content creation and uh, technical, SEO, technical SEO, say? So... The way I sort of break this up is based, uh, again, on where is your website? Um, how long have you had it up and running for? Um, how many SKUs do you have? Things like that. Um, if I'm running an e-commerce shop, the first thing I will focus in on is making sure that the content for each and every one of my products is at, at its best that it can possibly be. You can utilize systems like Surfer SEO that can look at all of the content on that page for the keywords that you're hoping to go after. I would spend more time on something like that. When it comes to technical SEO, unless you have massively glaring issues that are going to take a lot of fundamental time to sort of break down and then rebuild back up, you can do link building at almost exactly the same time. So when I look at, let's say, technical SEO for an established website, you're generally going to be talking about migrating from one platform to another. Um, that's how I will usually think about it. Mm -hmm. What you can do right now is you can actually start to build links to the, um, you can build backlinks to the URLs of the pages that exist previously and just focus on two things that need to happen after the migration. One, you've kept the URL slugs to be exactly the same. So mm -hmm. let's say that, you know, it's your website slash product A, you know, slash, and then that's it. The new URL being product A slash or something else, or instead of slash, it's .html, you want to make sure you have a 301 redirect in place. Mm -hmm. But it really what it's important to do is if you're making a decision to go with a technical SEO upgrade and you are making changes like that, to be more cognizant of what those changes would look like because if you s slow down link building as you've been doing it previously, you may actually end up being gapped by whoever's your next competitor. Okay. So what kind of different types of links are there? So that's a great question. <clears throat> um, there's a lot that sort of goes into it. The industry as, as a whole generally looks at two main metrics. Um, there's going to be DA, which comes from Moz, and DR, which comes from Ahrefs. So, so could you Moz, say DA, DA, what? Domain authority? To, yeah. Domain authority and domain rating. 
And these are two different rating systems that are used by two different platforms that basically what they do is they use all the knowledge that they've been able to gain over the years about link building um, altogether, how Google values these different keywords, the search intent, the search volume, the different publications that are showing up for those, and it will ascribe these different values to them. And so it'll look at a number of different things. So mm -hmm. for Ahrefs and Majestic, what they'll do is they'll look at the number of backlinks that are pointing to the site, how many backlinks go to that publication versus how many um, links are actually going out from it. So if you're utilizing a platform that only takes in, let's say, five links, but has over a thousand that are pointing out, Majestic would look at that and give it a very bad score. Mm -hmm. um, for a domain rating, Ahrefs will look at all of these different signals and find out how many keywords does your website um, currently rank for? What are the average rankings for those? What is the traffic that comes from those? Um, how much are you doing in paid media? How many links do you have coming into it? How many links are going out from it? Um, what are like how many pages deep are people actually interacting with your website? And then from that, it will actually give it a score. And so when our organization will do a link app analysis for a client, we'll look at their site and then up to three separate competitors, some very close, some a little bit, you know, those are loftier goals that you want to go after. And we will actually break it down by different tiers of DR links. So mm -hmm. how many DR 10 to 20, 20 to 30, et cetera. And looking at that, we'll be able to see what are your competitors doing. On top of that, we'll also un analyze all of the links that are going to your site right now, and then take a look and find out how many of these look unnatural. So Google will be able to tell very, very easily, and we see it all the time, where somebody will say, this is my money page. I'm not going to build anything to the home page. I'm going to build very little to any other um, pages that exist out there. I don't do a whole lot of content writing on my own. My blog isn't updated. But I all of a sudden have 1,200 um, different links that point to this one very specific page. Mm -hmm. We call that black sheeping, where basically you have a very, very unnatural amount of links that go towards one page and one page alone. That mm -hmm. is the money page for you. But what you've done is you've made it harder for yourself to be able to rank higher because you don't have a very holistic view of your website in Google. Mm -hmm. So what Google expects you to have like a natural looking, looking web link profile. Yeah. So would you um, expect someone like that to get a manual penalty on? Um, I, I use penalty very, very um, uh, lightly here. I don't know that there is a penalty that's being placed on the site. I do believe that part of the algorithm looks at all of the different trends that are going through and are able to see that something is being manipulated. And mm -hmm. what we try to work then is we try to quarantine that page where no more links are being built towards it. And instead, we'll build, we'll build links to the home page. We'll create um, topical maps and content clusters that then will rank naturally for a lot of those keywords. And the ones that are starting to rank naturally or are gaining traffic, that's when we'll actually start to point links at those. And then because it's raising all of the water, let's call it a berm that's in the middle. The ship gets stuck on it because that's where all the links are. As we raise everything else and the water starts to come up, then the ship can start to float on its own. That's generally how I try to look at it. So is it these days, I mean, because back in the day, right, kind of 10, 15 years ago, it was that you could, you know, one time strategy that worked was getting lots of links from um, low quality sites like directories, mm -hmm. right? I believe these days it's very much quality over quantity. I mean, what are yes. the what kind of what sort of what sort of links should you go after, and what sort of links should you avoid? So, when we talk about link building, there's two main ways of sort of doing it. There's one that's on your own, which is more bespoke outreach, right? It's a very time-consuming way of doing it. Where what you want to do is you want to look for sites that are niche relevant to your site. So, if you're running an e-commerce brand that sells household goods, you'd want to reach out to blogs oh. that have rank and traction for those same types of keywords. So if I'm selling Rubbermaid um, brooms, I would go to, let's say, a mommy blog or something along those lines that has a subsection of things that talk about cleaning, mm -hmm. right? We try to do the same thing in our 
um, level of outreach for our clients as well. We'll look for niche relevancy when it comes to the website. We make sure that it actually on a topic by topic level does follow what it is that you're talking about. And it's not super general. What you're talking about, we've also run into a lot of those things as well, where a client will come through and they'll have, let's say, 5,000 backlinks. And it's from a subdomain of a Wix holding page or WordPress.com, um, something to that effect, where they're mostly DA10 and lower. And it's just building what we would call a foundation. Nowadays, that foundation is actually moved up quite a bit, and the foundation should be more around the 10 to 20 range. But the niche relevancy we've seen is probably being the one most important pieces um, that's sort of taken off in the past couple of years. And I would actually argue that there's another layer deeper that you can go, which has to do with the keyword of the page for your site versus the keyword of the website that you want to go after. Okay. So again, using the analogy of, let's say, a Rubbermaid broom, you can actually utilize tools like Ahrefs to go and find all of the sites that actually do rank for those keywords. And when you can actually map those two things together, we actually are starting to see a lot more growth and a whole lot faster. So that's okay. part of our, our, our link building strategy. Okay. But presumably, you still need to contact those, those sites manually. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah. On our on our end, we handle a lot of the relationship because we've been doing it for such a long time that we know a lot of the publications and we'll reach out to them and we just make sure that it's easier for us to reach out to them versus just sending them an email saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could connect up? And although know. that is yeah. still a very, very good way of doing it. Aren't a lot of publications, don't they have um, uh, no-follow links? That... Um, yes That's... and no. So... When you're going after guest posts or link outreach, um, the publications that we work with, we are very clear that they we want them to be do follow. Yeah. Um, there is more stress that's been going on. We've been seeing a, a lot with helper reporter out um, and decision products, as well as digital PR on the whole, where we'll do outreach on a client's behalf. And you may not get a do follow link. You may end up with just a no follow link. But we are actually seeing that those have quite a bit of importance as well, because again, it's part of a general conversation about your website. Mm -hmm. And it can also be seen as very, very negative if you only have 6,000 do follow links versus having a smattering of those which are no follow. Again, it's part of the, we'll call it the natural conversation. Okay. So should, um, I mean, what, what are things that, you know, presumably, are there any kind of sites that people should definitely avoid? Like, for example, comments on blogs or directory side. So there are things that people definitely should avoid under all circumstances. I don't think I don't think either of those would be examples of avoid altogether. I think that they have yeah. low value, but they are things that you can do on your own that are generally very easy. What we do mm -hmm. is we like to avoid sites that at any point were a PBN. So PBNs PBN? were yeah, were huge in What's like PBN? Uh, between twenty twelve and like twenty eighteen, PBNs are called private blog networks. Right. And so SEO firms during around those times, what they would do is they would take you on as a client and they would pump you full of links unnaturally. And they were from all over the place. And as long as you continue to pay them, they would keep the links up. And the second that you ended your SEO campaign with them, they would just go away. So you, what you would have is a lot of these domains that then became free again because they, you know, uh, expired. And so people were picking them up and then would start to try to build them back up. And so they have a very specific look where they're using the same look as hundreds of other guest post sites. They have almost the same articles. Some of them actually just um, scrape the exact same articles on hundreds of different um, websites that look exactly the same as theirs. And really, they're just seen as being very, very spammy. They don't have a lot of value. And honestly, customers, rightly so, look at them and say, when Google figures out that a new version of a PBN exists, they're going to penalize these very, very specifically, and we just don't want to have anything to do with them. Okay. So our customers across the board, we like to work with them and tell them, we, we vet for PBNs to make sure that this site, when you look at Wayback Machine, it has never been a PBN before. Okay. So how do you determine what kind of link building you need to do as a business? Um, one of the big, best things you can possibly do is a link gap analysis. 
when you can I clearly identify who your client or your um, competitors are, it makes it much easier for you to do a link app analysis on your own. And you can kind of look and just see what are the different ranges of DR or DA that your competitors have. And it will start to show you the types of link building that you need to do. For a lot of clients, they're starting out and they may have less than 500 backlinks. But their competitor, you know, let's say that it's a roofer in Tampa Bay, Florida. If I'm going, if I'm a newer site and I'm going after somebody who's been around for 20 years, I would want to look at not only what are the DA ranges or DR ranges they have, but what are the specific sites that they're getting things from? Are they suppliers? Uh, if I'm doing roofing, I'm probably working with Corning um, and different roofing products like that. Are they being referenced in directories there? I would then know the type of link building that I should be doing. If they're mostly being talked about in a number of different blogs or articles or things like that, I know the things that I could potentially avoid. Another thing that some clients will start to do from the get-go is to actually look at all of the links that a competitor has, find out how many of them they, they can get on their own from that same publication, and then actually do outreach looking to that. Using the roofer example, if I'm a roofer in Tampa Bay and I'm working, I see that one of the backlinks is a roofing directory. They, they've got 10 different things in their listicle. I can reach out to that publication and ask, can you add me as the 11th? Or I see that this one has gone out of business. Would you mind updating it to include mm -hmm. my website that's on there? Uh, these are ways for you actually to not only get the same link that they have, which then sort of helps bolster you as a part of that conversation, but it shows you really, really easily what your competitors are doing and then where they may not be putting a lot of their effort. So if you see somebody has a ton of links that are in the 10 to 30 range, and then a few up top, you know, you can build a very, very similar foundation to them, but then move up to 40s and 50s, start to have that be a part of the chatter, and then build up naturally over time. So by the time you get to the 80s or 90s, you have a very full-fledged um, foundation that's there to put the 80s and 90s on top. What I run into a lot are people who have a ton at the bottom, and then they try to get a ton at the top, and then it just gets very wobbly. Okay, what is it? Just looks unnatural, you mean? Or, yes. Or... Yes. Okay. So, what would it be unnatural? That mean that you wouldn't perform as well on Google as if you just got a, a like a range of links. Well, it depends on the keyword difficulty. So, if you're going after something that has low difficulty, you probably don't have a lot of people who are able to beat your authority on that subject. But if it's a very, very high difficulty keyword, that means you have a lot of people who can assert similar types of authority, and then um, sort of take over your position. Mm -hmm. If you don't look authoritative and you don't have a natural um, link profile, Google, we've seen it a number of times, will come through and actually, they're not necessarily going to penalize you, but they're not going to put you up top. They're not going to put you a part of that larger conversation because they don't know that you're being talked about in the same way as your competitors. Okay. So how is AI going to affect link building or has it affected it already? It has. Um, the main ways that I'm seeing people utilizing AI right now has to do with outreach. Um, if you want to write an email that's going to go out to a publication asking if you can do a link swap with them or you want to be added onto their listicle, people are using AI today to write those emails and send them out um, en masse. Another way that I'm seeing it be, be done is there's a number of YouTube channels that talk about how they use AI to get backlinks. Nine times out of 10, if you're using AI to get backlinks using the methodologies they're talking about, you're getting a lot of sub DA or sub DR20 backlinks. Yeah. And this may be good, but you know, it's an easy way to get a backlink, but you have to understand that not all backlinks are created equal. Okay. And you may just end up in a new form of a PBM. Okay. So what, um, what steps do you, would you, even if you're starting from zero, launching a website, what steps would you take to do link building? Um, what I tell most of the customers I work with is work on local citations first. Those are like very low level local indicators that talk about your website, you know, an announcement, let's call it like a press release or something to that effect. And then I'll actually just find out who I'm trying to compete with. 
and then immediately look at their lower level links, the types of link building that they're doing holistically, and then just target different groups. Now, when you work together with an agency with like ours and the multiple brands that we have, what you can actually do is you can actually go in and say, I can see that my competitor has a bunch of DA20 um, backlinks. If you're working with one of our brands like Authority Builders, you can actually go and find the specific site that you want to get a backlink from, or you can work with one of our sales team and they will actually go and put together a plan package for you that would then allow you to know that you're going to get a bunch of DA20s, but they are going to be niche relevant to you. Um, I would not go super high on the domain authority or domain rating at first and try to get a bunch of backlinks from there until I've been able to really structure what my base is going to look like. From there, look at how can you optimize the content on your website, making sure that you're, you have enough keywords that make sense to be a part of the conversation with Google. If you look at how AI is being used right now with something like Gemini, there's a lot of search intent that has to be determined through that. And that's another very important piece that you can be doing on your own website. When you're looking at the content, let's say, again, it's a, it's a product that you're trying to sell. Do you have enough keywords that are inside of that page that make it so that it starts to rank for it? If you're, like, uh, if you're selling, let's say, you know, um, hats that are being knitted, right? How much content is there? Do you have five sentences? Do you have 10 sentences? Do you have, you know, 500 words? What are the types of keywords that you're optimized for? And then once you figure out those keywords that you're optimized for, that's when you should also go back to the backlinking and trying to get things up and running on that side too. Again, to perform niche relevant, you know, backlink outreach. So do you ever do any, any Barney links or do you, I mean, I know there's things that people have done in the past. Is that something you get involved yes. with anymore? So, yes. So our brand authority builders, we do have a, a, a number of sites that we work with where you would come to our website, you would buy a backlink for it. We would set up the relationship and make sure that the content that's written for that site is niche relevant and that it's being posted on a niche relevant website on your behalf. It's an easy way for you to sort of speed up that process. Um, and we see that it works time and time again. So that's something that's against Google's rules, isn't it? Yes. In the sense that when you see that there's a lot of unnatural links that are taking place. However, it's something that we have also been seeing that still works just as it had yeah. years and years ago. Yeah, I suppose it's difficult to, uh, it's a gray area, isn't it? I think it's. Yes. I mean, if you're looking at the time it takes for you to do bespoke outreach, to reach out to each and every one of those niche relevant websites that are for you, it's a full-time job, right? Yeah. What we do is we actually still reach out to them. We still pitch them on everything that needs to get done. We just speed up the process for you. And we write the content for you and make sure that it, it actually has relevancy. So what kind of budget? I mean, if people, if people want to... Um... You know, seriously, actually start building up the the domain authority. What kind of budget do they need to start with? So, we always try to recommend a thousand dollars a month as a good starting point. And what this will generally do is it will allow us to find exactly who your competitors are and all of the backlinks that you need to have in order to start being a part of the conversation. So, a thousand dollar may get you um, eight links one month of a certain DR range, it may get you five links the month after that when it comes to another DR range. But what we do is we work very, very cleanly to make sure that every single link that we're getting for you has niche, niche relevancy, that it's a part of the conversation in a very positive way, and that we're diversifying where those links are going. Again, the one thing you want to always avoid is having too many links go to one very specific page. Okay. There is a lot of chatter that goes on that says you can have 1,500 links that go directly to your homepage, and then it just sort of leeches through you know, the rest of the pages. And whereas As some of that link juice, quote unquote link juice, can actually go to the other pages, when you build the links directly to those pages and have it be a part of the conversation, and it has those signals to Google, we see tons of value. So niche relevance is something you, you, you say time and time again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's particularly important. 
Yes. So what that really means is if you're running um, an e-commerce brand and you are selling a certain type of product, again, let's use brooms, and you end up on a finance blog, the niche relevancy is just not really going to be there. So your site is going to have a number of keywords that you want to tackle over time. Having an eye on niche relevancy means when you are going after those publications, that makes sense. If they have that niche relevancy, at some point, your Venn diagram is going to start to connect. You're going to go after the same keywords. Google is going to see the signals via vectorization. But if you're going after a finance blog and they're not going to ever get those keywords, that value just isn't simply going to be there in the same way. And when you actually drill down a little bit further and you have either part of your own outreach or if you're utilizing a platform like us and you start to target the very specific keywords that your site has and the site that you want to get from your publication, that's when you're going to start to see things get supercharged because the conversation is now vectorized. They can see that there's a direct pass. So... Yeah, sorry. Um, vectorization... you're, very good, you're, very good with, you're very good at not uh, bringing in terms, not explaining them. Yeah, I I'm apologize. Apologize. <laughs> um, so vectorized search is sort of a new way that Google, we've been seeing, it sort of connects different terms together. So for example, my name, right? My name is going to be associated with a number of different people that it's seen connections with on the internet. It's going to then also connect me with my history in web hosting. It's going to connect me with authority builders, with NextNet Media, and things like that. But there may be terms that are on NextNet Media and my background in web hosting, what it sees for me on LinkedIn, that it will connect me with when it comes to somebody else in some other organization. Same thing with keywords. So if you were to look at topical authority and you went after, let's say, brooms, you would have 150 separate options for how you could have that keyword parsed together and all of those different things. But no matter how you try to do that, there's always going to be Rubbermaid. Rubbermaid will always be associated with that, even though they've really made a name for themselves. But there are then going to be products owned by Rubbermaid and their parent company that will also be tangentially associated with those things. And so any keyword you have will have a number of things that are of topical authority and those which stick out over here. Maybe it's the guy who founded Rubbermaid. Maybe it's these other terms. And what you start to see is that this vectorization can then be turned into a visual where instead of just having a bunch of Venn diagrams that go over, you have one keyword term here, and then it just spikes out in a thousand different directions and it can have mm-hmm. a thousand different things that go with it. And that is consistently and constantly changing from Google's standpoint. Okay. Well, so look, it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot about link building. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I've got a final question for you. What is it, has, has anything inspired you recently? Something, what do you do when you're not doing link building? I noticed you've got an Arsenal flag behind you, for yeah. example, and some little cars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I huge soccer fan. Um, I loved Arsenal since I was a kid. Um, really one of the most inspiring things I've probably done over the past uh, couple of months is I revisited a book that I read forever ago called truth and comedy. And mm-hmm. it really walks you through the history of improv comedy okay. and its implications are very, very wide, widespread. So for me personally, I love using it when I talk with my different sales teams because it really gets you to have a better understanding of how to keep a conversation moving in the right direction. Trevor, you did a great job. You saw that I was struggling with being able to provide that additional relevancy that would have been helpful for the audience. And you were able to interject and say, hey, let's, let's try to dig into this a little bit more. Very, very same thing. So the book talks all about the history of improv comedy. Yes, and the different improv Olympic games that are out there and just how to sort of go with the flow, go with the conversation and make it something that people actually want to be a part of. Um, I've noticed that's been a very helpful book in a myriad of other things I've done in my life. Um, Just even including a conversation like this of being able to continue on, continue to talk about whatever the topic is. I I really do revisit it at a time. What's it called again? It's called Truth in Comedy. Truth in Comedy. That sounds great. I'm going to give that a read. Matt, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. And how can people well, find you online? Well, you can find me online um, by going to my LinkedIn. I will always uh, get the information over to you, Trevor, um, if you can post it up on 
the show notes. Well. Um, and then there's also authority dot builders. Um, authority dot builders is the brand that me and uh, my group, we run. Um, we are SEO professionals from all around the world. And, you know, we're here to help and give any um, advice that we possibly can. Excellent. Well, you see, you know your stuff. So I think people should get in contact yeah. with you. Matt, thank you very much right. and goodbye. Well, thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye.